teleport in. Okay. And I think we is ready to begin episode numero five. Hodge. Yes. I think they call it a uh, Cinco. Cinco. The Cinco phone. We can Cinco our watches mm. to episode five. You can Cinco your watch to my Cinco phone. Or my FaceTime party snoozer. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I like Tim and Eric, if people didn't guess that already in the last 11 seconds, as was referenced very obscure Tim and Eric skits. Those guys are really great. They are good. It's something to, do you think? Do you think Tim or Eric would like Relic Blade? Like, I feel like Eric would at least like laugh at the drawing that you drew. Yeah, I don't know. I suppose he's really big into wine now. I follow him on Instagram, and he just is always eating fancy food and drinking wine and eating mm. pizza and dancing about hamburgesi. That's pretty cool. Um. Yeah. Speaking of people who are like celebrities and stuff and may or may not like Relic, in the past you sent, I don't remember why, why I was thinking about this just last week, but I was talking with my nephew and I, I was just thinking about the fact that I know like that, that you sent packages to some pretty cool places over the years, you know, Relic Blade is in the hands of some, even if not publicly. It's it's definitely touched the hands of some pretty big names in the industry, some big designers, mm -hmm. and and sent relic blade packages to cool uh, corporate offices of yeah. interesting businesses. Yeah, pretty fun. Some of the guys at Wizards of the Coast play. That's fun. Yeah, it's cool to think about. Mm -hmm. But Sean, what's happening? Hey, everybody, we're here. We're hanging. It's been a minute since we've done a Relic Buds, but we're still Buds. So, yeah. naturally... And there's still Relic stuff. It's just... Tons of Relic <laughs> stuff. Summer Summertime is not the same every week when you have a kid that's not in school. So it's oh, been yeah. A bit, yeah. I think that's the more complicated thing. It's just like, I, my schedule's not... It's not as uh, set in stone, kind of, as, yeah. as, as I... Yeah, because then I was I went on a vacation after we did our KubaCon trip. We both took about a month to then go on another trip. Yeah. <laughs> um, even if it was like a short one. Yeah, because you went how far is Mon was Monterey from Napa? Like a hundred plus miles, or not even no, that far? I don't, oh, it's not that far. It's, it's not like 100? a three hour. Oh, ride. okay. All right. Yeah, because yeah, I went from. Salt Lake City, Utah, all across Wyoming to South Dakota to Deadwood, South Dakota. And that was about that drive is interesting because <clears throat> it was about the same length as the drive to California in terms of uh, miles and time. Uh -huh. And I remember thinking like, oh, that's that's not cool. Like I gotta drive that. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna drive it. I'm gonna do it. And when I've done it before, I can do it again. No problem. But for some reason, like driving ten hours through Wyoming was like legit pleasant. <laughs> it was kind of like driving <laughs> through Rohan. That's how I described it yeah. at some point. I was like, this place is beautiful. Yeah, There's so yeah, many way different than trying to cross the uh, desert. Exactly. But then I was thinking about going across northern Nevada, the entire state of northern Nevada. And then through the mountains, uh, which I'm forgetting the name of them up north. Sierra. The Sierra Mountains. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. That was when things kind of got interesting. The Sierras was an yeah. interesting drive. But holy shit. The drive across the, the landscape of northern Nevada, it was rem I was listening to an old Conan story. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't remember which one because they're kind of they the ones that I choose to listen to are all like the one shot like short ones that are like only like an hour long or 50 minutes and those are all kind of the same but you still love them anyway all I remember is afghulis you know uh there's these words being thrown around and things like that but I'm listening to one of the the Conan stories and they're sort of describing like the the area of Samaria where they're at the area of Samaria and 
I was, as I'm driving through the wasteland desert, I'm like, oh, yeah, it's like that. It looks probably like that. Like, yeah. this is a horrible place that you wouldn't <laughs> want to be walking around it. Like, it's, yeah. it, it's no water, nothing interesting. It's just, you know, like, low shot of a, of a bone, of a skull. And then yeah, you, you know you want to you want to be listening to or imagining your Fallout adventures. Yeah, out there. <laughs> you're out there in yeah, the exactly. In the in the rad wastes. Cuz yeah, that's how it felt. But those 10 hours like were were over quick in the Wyoming one cuz there's just areas of it where they had like the soil looks so I think and I don't know anything about soil, but I think it was like rich in oxygen, oxidized, very red. Uh, I think that's what happens when the soil is like red, but this this contrast of these like crazy red soil against lush green, you know, it was like the coolest combination of green red complementary that didn't remind you of Christmas. Mm, I was, you yeah. know, I was like, whoa, nature, you crazy? Yeah, man. You know, but yeah. So it's been a while since we've been we've got together to chat on the podcast, and it's also we're we're navigating the the unique new space of what's it called like when we have a we got a podcast we have things we want to talk about but then we also just want to talk like regular stuff and it's just like oh what's the regular stuff we're going to talk about because i i hit you up the other day and i was like oh if we can't record a podcast well that's fine because i have stuff i want to tell you that i can't even put on the podcast anyway so let's (laughs) so let's talk you know and then we were just just chatting and like that uh, so yeah, that that fun new space of being like, let's talk. Wait, maybe we should, because then we can talk later and record it. But maybe we shouldn't do that either. Maybe we should just talk now. You know, it's a uh, yeah. The problem, yeah, and we keep running into scheduling problems because you got to stream. No, yep. and and then on it's really like Monday is our day to record. Yeah, but then this Monday was. But then Mondays yeah. are also just the busiest day of the week mm-hmm. because you have to likes. Oh yeah, and then the fourth. Then, yep, it was it was the holiday. So different things going. So on. we had like but, two yeah. Sundays this week. So this week has just felt really weird to me. That's true. But there was there's cool stuff going on. I mean, I think part of the big like Metal King Studio update is definitely. Um, dialing in the final details for the overall release of the solo adventure because uh, the solo supplement has new rules for the format of course and that's a portion of it there's a bunch of lore for the story of it Um, but then there's of course the monsters that are unique to that adventure and it introduces this new like new threat and new enemies and and everything um which of course leads to needing to sculpt the monsters which i did and so those those, that's getting into production um but then dialing in exactly what cards i need and then what packaging needs to be made and what details need to be written for all that so it's a lot of project management that i've been working on you know, spending a lot of time trying to organize the hierarchy of like what needs to happen first, so that it can actually so deliver. Makes, actually, yeah, uh, yeah. But yeah, with the new figures, it looks like well, we were talking earlier. Have we? About, you're saying new figures, and uh-huh. I'm. I was just reminded when you were talking that it was. This was one of the kind of off, uh, off camera, off camera, off, you know, unrecorded conversations that we had just a little while ago that we. Yeah, some big decisions were made. I'm not sure um, if we shared that you're retooling the like those figures, you know, because oh, like yeah. people know that you sculpted those Og tool ones, right? You know, but now to make them appropriate for Relic Blade, because like there was a lot of things that you you discovered, and I was learning that like to make a you didn't sculpt those figures initially like in the relic blade style even though they're in your style so to speak yeah. you know so there's like these tiny little details that like no one really can understand but you about the way that you changed those the troglodyte you know og figures that 
you've shown over, you know, over the while yeah, you originally sculpted them. Yeah, because I sculpted, sculpted them. them first uh, on my birthday, November 14th of 2021. Mm-hmm. I had some free time and, like, was feeling kind of selfish, I guess. Like, <laughs> not selfish, but, like, indulgent. Mm-hmm. And so I indulged exactly. myself to just, word. like, sculpt a wacky, wacky creature. Um, you know, kind of inspired by the um, Rankin Bass uh, orcs from Lord of the Rings, but also kind of like Muppet like or these like troll guys. And it was just messing around with these like big mouth. Monsters. I love the Muppet angle. I never thought about the Muppet <laughs> yeah. angle before. And so, so yeah, I just messed around with that and then like sculpted a bunch just for my own messing around with my 3d printer and and stuff just having fun Uh, what just having fun oh yeah just having fun and then you know the big thing then during december and january and february was getting the um, sludge first sludge army finished and in production and released yeah that's right um and then also i think at that time was when i published sludge nations So there's like, that was a really major supplement release for Sludge. A lot of Sludge, a lot of big stuff on the mind. Another Sludge army. And so in that time, I also did a little messing around with fantasy stuff just for fun. But I didn't know exactly where to put them. And then in the development of of the lore and the story that I want to tell with the solo supplement... Um, I was I put those monsters in as wild monsters, and then, yeah, then recognizing the style and detail of those like quick sketches, essentially I did for my own like fun, mm-hmm. needed to be refined into and brought into the Relic Blade universe. So like things like scale and proportion, but also castability for yep, engineering, the engineering them for print, uh, and then also connecting the lore to the sculpts and yeah, really unifying the whole thing. And, and so I knew I wanted to do that and it actually took a lot more effort than I was expecting because those sketch sculpts, um, seemed done, not quite good enough, but you know, they existed. Um, and it, that actually didn't get me that far in the whole process. I had to kind of take those and you did almost, redo them. Yeah. <laughs> un, un, because you For weren't the- even designing them to be molded initially you know and there's and we talk about this all the time you know when we're hanging out and we talk about uh you know, just like industry stuff where what's what's happening what what's kind of the, the trends and things and one that we always talk about is the like the 3d patreon like these uh, 3d sculpt was sort of engineered for uh 3d print type uh, figure sellers and how just from like a normal person's perspective if you've ever looked at those 3d stl uh renders of files and been like wow like that model is like crazy that model is amazing like it's so cool how would they how could they even do that and you know and the, the the answer is like that they can't do that <laughs> exactly it doesn't. um it, it doesn't work really and and yeah. that's why they're renders uh yeah. and that those things won't ever be able to be manufactured on a scale because designing a model to be 3D printed is one thing. Designing a model to be casted in a two-par mold or whatever, whatever, completely different uh, Mm -hmm. vibe. So yeah, you had to take those quick sketches and really apply the the relic plates on the center touch. A lot of work went into you know, getting the scale right for the figures to be mm-hmm. compared to other races in Relic Blade because it's like it's like a new species of monster, the ape ape clans. Um, yeah. So, anyways, I finished that, got those three D prints ready. Like since the last time we talked on, on Relic Buds, finished refining those sculpts, and uh, and then three D printed prototypes of them on my home printer to make sure that the proportion was right and i ended up having to do a bunch of prints to try and get the proportion just right and like the tabs and all of this like nonsense of castability Um, and like finding finding little spaces like there's like 
uh, a weird example or a good example is the clan chieftain has a big beard. Here, let me see. Uh, here's on um, if the webcam is recording, you can see there's a guy. Anyways, down here he's got a big beard, and actually the 3D file, the beard didn't touch his body, so there was like a bubble of air inside there. Oh, so weird. then if it was getting cast, it's potential that it would collapse or break the 3D print. So, uh, you know, lots of dumb little details, but finally oh, yeah, sorted so that weird. out. Um, and then got the high-res prints made so that I could get send them off for mold making. But there was one small bit that had one quarter where, or little corner where the supports had failed. And so it just didn't print there. And so that one bit not being printed has delayed the project a whole week. Like, it's crazy. You know, I just think I was, I was, I was talking to you earlier saying I felt like I was like running in place. Yeah, we were talking about dribbling. We were, yeah, we're saying we, yeah, we're dribbling, like, yeah, but we're not going down the court and shooting shots yeah, and scoring. Yeah, exactly. And I thought that was a really good metaphor because like dribbling, moving up the court and making the shot and then scoring the points is like, that's of the progress. I feel like I've just been dribbling in place, not even making progress for ages. Yeah. I mean, it takes time to like look back and be like, oh, the reason you feel like you haven't made any progress on Relic Blade is because you produced 42 new sludge miniatures and a new book for it. Like, mm -hmm. you don't need to be too hard on yourself. There are yeah, probably some people about... who didn't write a new book this year. <laughs> but I just, I just feel like still I feel a lot of pressure wanting Relic Blade to be done. Um, but it's that kind of thing. Like, one little misprint and it's that, you know? Like well, if it's you were interesting. Playing a game and they said, and they said, uh, progress on building your new barracks uh, went wrong. Come back uh, yeah, in one yeah. week. And you oh my gosh, bro! Like, hey, come don't, on. don't even give the these mobile yeah. developers and their microtransactions. I know, I they're, yeah, they're gonna do that. They're like, bro, your product, your your gem production facility has gone down. If you pay five dollars, the the expert engineers will fix it today. And then you can yeah, get more I would, jet. <laughs> I would do that. I would do that. Yeah. So, uh, but anyways, I've got so I've got almost all the high res prototypes for ten new relic blade figures, except one bit that should be arriving today, and then I'll send those off to my mold maker. So the figures are almost out of my hands and on to into production, and then now I'm going to be focusing on rules writing for those figures as a relic blade faction rather than Ooh. just as monsters and i because like especially now that the figures are uh really refined into the relic blade aesthetic and and setting um looking at them i was just like there's this has to be playable like this ha this can't be just monsters because they're so cool and I yes. really like them. And uh, in rules writing, you know, thinking about what separates them from battle pigs, because I think that you could look at these ape trolls and, and, and see, correlation. see them as orcs, right? Yeah, yeah. And you can look at battle pigs and you can see them as orcs. And so, like, rules design-wise, figuring out exactly how their play styles are going to be different, and I've got some really cool ideas. Um, it's going to be really a barbarian keyword focused faction or at least the factions that will be barbarian focused so yes. i can start to develop them as like barbarian style fighters rather than fighter style fighters you know because those are two separate classes in relic mm -hmm. blade the barbarian versus fighter or you know just like if you play dnd you'd know i guess people who listen to this podcast know about relic blade but <laughs> yeah i think but, so uh, but the yeah because pigs are have a barbarian and have a fighter and have that kind of stuff, but they've got the pig keyword. And so these will have an ape keyword, play different, have different sort of stats, um, but also are very unique and also are launching in a really unique way where there's going to be a full background explaining yeah. where they come from and all the lore about where 
like how they developed as a magical race of of sentient ape monsters and how they got weaponized by an ancient god and yeah so i'm really excited i feel like it it is the perfect thing that we want always wanted for solo was that solo would drive the storyline that then opens up into not only the solo play but other campaigns and then also introduces you to factions because like I would have loved to be able to. Would have I shouldn't talk about it in the past test. It would be really cool to be able to introduce the storyline of the Muldorf, being, uh, finding the surface and that adventure that happens where the archaeologian is gathering a crew of explorers to go on this like, like a suicide mission to try and find out if the surface world exists. Like that's a really specific storyline that existed in my head and i wrote some about in the moldorf lore and for the kickstarter but we we didn't get to play through it yeah whereas with this we you really do get to play through the like emergence of the Ogsul ape this clans new story and like where they come from and why why some of them are mutated into giant slime eyeballs and why you know how magic works for their um for their cultures and in their clans and so it's all really it's so exciting for me it's uh, and i'm really excited about the project but it also is dragging on with these like little delays here and there that i feel discouraged sometimes but yeah i don't know actually just now presenting the whole picture i was like, i think i know what you're about to say and i think i feel exactly yeah. the same being able to present the whole picture of what's going on has me really excited and really in encouraged about the whole project. Yes, because um, that's kind of what I was thinking. We, we use the analogy of the dribbling thing, right? Yeah. And it's like, sure. And I was, and I was saying in our earlier conversation, like, yeah, like dribbling and not going, you know, in the full context of the basketball analogy, dribbling by itself isn't, what you want necessarily you want to be shooting the hoops and scoring and stuff but to think about how important a good dribbling game is to actually get down the court and shoot and score is also interesting as well because there is a great many people who practice a lot of dribbling and getting good at dribbling and all this thing and so this makes me think about how we ha you feel that way you know this this sort of like kind of stuck without that progression but considering that notion of practicing dribbling, even though it is doing something like in place, yeah. um, it does it does build in the future. And in that analogy, what we've been doing and why I feel like maybe it's taken so long is because we are, you know, if you have a practice play that every time you get the ball and all your boys are in the right position and everybody knows what the play is going, you know where you're going to move, you know how to take the shot, everything is practice, it's all, y'all know. We've never, we're running a play that we've never ran before, you know, and that's why it's taking so long. But as you were just laying all that stuff out, that's what I was like realizing. I'm like, yeah, that's exactly true, but, at, but we are delivering something that is, because it's, it's, it's kind of weird, it's like, it's we're delivering solo but it's not really that like it's we're really it's it's not just that like it's not it's just like, a, a a supplement that you're gonna it's play next, it's it's yeah. it's a whole system evolution yeah of and it's the way delivering that, relic blade for the first time in a way yeah you know it's, that it's it's funny because um i've talked about it a lot of times before but as a solo production i always have to cut out features to make like a minimum product mm -hmm. and so like starting out i was like all right sean i know you love war games you know you're ready to like try and make warhammer fantasy uh, or like you know more time right off the bat but you've got to like really cut it down and like um and so it was like all right a knight because i love knights 
and he's going to be fighting two pigs and like <laughs> that's it that's like you got to really really pare it down and so the first kickstarter was like uh all right there are, i know relics exist we'll have you get grab a relic you'll hit guys with a sword you'll dodge you'll understand how you know protect your friends works and you're going to have like an interesting puzzle delivered in that first box but um you know, then introducing factions, new characters. Like, for a long time, the game didn't even have a wizard. It was a fantasy game without a wizard, right? Mm-hmm. I don't remember uh, us and talking finally about doing the this, this. Not the most recent Kickstarter, the Moldorf Kickstarter. It was like, we've got dwarves and elves in a fantasy setting, finally. <laughs> Yay. Uh, and then it's like, all right, guys, now that we have a wizard, we've got dwarves, elves, Blizzard men, undead, knights, rangers, like we've got some of the stuff set up. We need a two player set. And that was the last Kickstarter, right? Mm-hmm. And so with this, it's like, all right, finally, now that the races of the world exist, I'm going to be able to send you guys finally on to explore that world. Yes. Yeah. Like, and, and Solo is, a, is, a, has always, well, not always. Solo is is an interesting, new, but old, but weird, but not weird. Um, yeah. Gameplay experience that a lot of people haven't really done. But cooperative games like D and D are aren't weird. Like we, you know, how, people know how that. Bro, works. I'm thinking but about got, Golden Axe. You know, but back like in the you, day. you put you you put a player driven game engine like a tabletop game where you have to know the rules and you have to execute them, but it has to stay fun. You can't just be like doing like bookkeeping at the table or at least Mm -hmm. like, I don't prefer that style of play. Um, Yeah. There's just a lot going into the whole thing, but yeah, now that we mention it, I feel like if I had been able to deliver relic blade fully formed from the beginning, it might have been, this you know Mm -hmm. it might have really been the story of of battle pigs raiding and the those three or four heroes from that first box set fighting against the pigs and then an alternate campaign where you play as the warlord trying to trying to take territory as a pig you know but um the whole thing is very exciting. The project is finally really coalescing and getting closer to what looks like a mid to late August release. Yeah. Um, and also the intention was to not go to Kickstarter. But I also have the question of like, how many things do I order if I'm going to be shipping the day it releases? And so it's possible I'll need to do a pre-order just so yeah. that... That Just so be. that I I don't accidentally order too little, because when I released the um, Apostles of the Deep set in 2020, um, I had to it went out of stock like right away because I only had like 200, um, and then I ordered a bunch more, and then it went out of stock right away again, and then I ordered a bun- ton more. And then it just like did a couple more sales, and so mm. then I and now you got a now you metal. got your big yeah, yeah yeah so For so sure. maybe what I'll do is a, a like two week pre order or a one week pre order just so I know how much to order initially. Yeah, um, that'd be really so cool. But it. so let's just like go over that like real uh-huh. quick for peeps that maybe didn't fully catch it the first time. But yeah, the Ogsul are. Not just coming as solo monsters, because the, 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 the booklet for the solo play has the monster cards that allow you to Yeah, and all their lore. Them. Yeah, exactly. and all their lore yeah. and stuff. But also a new faction set. Brand, yeah. We've got a brand new faction set that's coming to Relic Play, but it's not just yeah. the faction set. We're, talk- we're pretty much, you're pretty much coming out the gates with like uh, the Goblin 2.0 release. Yeah, you know, well, but... <laughs> yeah, because it's, it's a faction set and three solos, expansion yeah. characters. So, <laughs> so, um, so right out the gate, they'll be like more developed than Bone and Darkness. Yeah, 
which yeah. is uh that's the what what they call that that's kind of like the um like the the youngest child benefit like the oldest child kind of doesn't get anything yeah. and then it kind of like trickles yeah. down to the it's sort of, the parent is learning <laughs> yeah exactly that's pretty much yeah. exactly what's happening with yeah. uh relic blade but it's curiously enough thinking about you know how you're saying the how this sort of like iteration this sort of form it for me being able to kind of think about this format and stuff has been so enjoyable and i felt uniquely qualified to do it mostly because i know uh, how passionate i am about relic blade but then on top of that i have played with many toys by myself for many many hours as a only child you know so this this realm of creating scenarios and rules uh, a sort of thematic structure to playing with your toys i've been doing that strangely enough for just many years i i still fondly remember my gi joe like uh shadow moses style of gameplay that i developed to play gi joes like on my desk you know and i it was very simple i had a sort of like a some, some not a cutting map but something kind of like a like a dinner placement map on on my desk and i had very simple like uh pieces to create the terrain there was you there was um the jewel cases for the playstation one but the 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 dual ones do you remember the bigger ones oh yeah so i would yeah. use those one of them was like always oh, my final fantasy 7 case for example i would use i was those. gonna say that's like the iconic that's the one that i yeah i use those i have like three or four those double-sided jewel cases would turn into staircases and i would be able to move them to different areas of my little placement mat to be like this is the entrance to the room and if my gi joe cleared the room because it was the game was always snake eyes versus cobra goons it was like metal gear solid gi joe setup but Beautiful. the the play area was just quote unquote these different rooms and every time i would set up the room using like i said these jewel cases for staircases and other little implements for tape like tables my favorite um little uh, i guess we'll call it set piece was a couple of flat legos that I would take the make the connections deliberately weak instead of making those connections really strong so that I would create like a breakable WWE table and I would then throw Cobra guys from high places into it and it would break and then I would be satisfied you know so terrain. exactly yeah. there's just all these little elements built in I had like security cameras and just rules for how my GI Joe had to operate to get through these levels you know and i just think about all of these strange things that i would do when i was little and then i'm like i had no idea that, <laughs> that that this these would be developable like developed skills you know i'm really good at playing by myself you know and i can i can help facilitate you to play by yourself <laughs> because mm -hmm. so it's uh it's a very interesting like rap route because i mean there's so much to it you know we talk about the delivering story things that we've always mentioned with relic blade and what i've kind of tried to frame relic blade in my mind is like this a saturday morning cartoon adventure you know that you can play a relic blade adventure kind of like flipping on a, a now i'm talking like old style television like uh the star trek next generation style where every episode is different as opposed to now how tv's shows are just like extremely long yeah. movies yeah. um um i'm talking about like the the old style where every like episode the week. yeah has to kind of address something and that's what i think is exciting about relic because we can we can do that we can explore concepts that you know touch on real world things that we're like dealing with or feeling with um but also like you said i want to explore what the moldor story because there's a lot as soon as you were describing just you saying the suicide mission to find the surface you know like 
what's suicidal about finding the surface, you know, but just that in that sort of positioning that the Moldorf people think is crazy. Like yeah. go up there, like that's crazy. You know, there's there's interesting drama in that like internal uh you know relationship between the Moldorf people that I'm like, that's interesting. That'd be cool to explore. Maybe there's yeah. other Moldorfs that don't want you to find the surface because the Moldorf king is like his whole thing is re relies on you not believing in the surface or something, you know? So there's, there's, there's weird, there's lots of things to unpack in, in each episode of a relic blade adventure. And if you look at any faction set and simply ask yourself, what is that story? What, yeah. what's that adventure? You know, there's, yeah, and that's the thing is like there, for me, like I know the answers to a lot of those questions, but I haven't had, the right like format to deliver it yet because like like i was saying before about video games like with the video game you can have so much stuff be behind the scenes whereas i can't have word bubbles pop up over your miniatures yeah just have them say stuff about themselves oh, yeah or you can't design a room that no one's ever going to see you, you in the video yeah. game. You specifically design only what the player is supposed to. Do, yeah. As yeah, opposed exactly. to where, well, I mean, yeah, just anything from a pop-up to like, just how, how to open a door to like characters interacting with each other. Like I've been playing, um, triangle strategy, triangle strategy. Pack, what a great name. Tactics RPG. And, uh, and you know, there'll be moments where you're in, a battle and like there'll be i guess there must be like a trigger like the first time you wound a character or when they get to have health or whatever but they'll like narr narration narrative will happen like the character will taunt the other character or you know simple things like that oh like the guy like, will say something because yeah, of something like, that it'd happened be tough. you can't really have that sort of emergent thing where you're like all right when you critically wound the yeah roll on the warlord. response He's chart say this yeah, it's like, <laughs> all right yeah because you can't be flipping around stuff you know mm -hmm. i don't know like those just really simple stuff a video game can do that delivering it on tabletop is is more complicated um heck i don't know maybe I, part of it is having a dm where you can well like, you know what, like what happens but me and you mind like because i was thinking the same thing yeah Cause like, Cause, that's yeah, what does know. it depends. Everyone plays different and has different types of hobbies and, and like relic blade ends up being like straddling between, between wargaming and role playing. Mm -hmm. And I think people bring their expectations to it. So like someone could come to it and expect it to be more like more time, which it isn't really like more time or yeah. someone could come to it and expect it to be like D and D and it isn't really like D and D. And so like, you know, or expect it to be like Diablo, and it's not really like Diablo. So, yeah, I, d I don't know. I think I think that's what's making that's what we're kind of, going back yeah. to the dribbling thing. That's why I feel like we've been in the dribbling stage because we're like yeah. we're figuring stuff out. And and yeah. one of the things that I'm like kind of coming to realization as you were just saying that is like there's expectations that. You know, we're all carrying those biases and stuff. And I've talked about it on previous episodes and stuff where, like, people that get into this hobby are generally going to come in through Games Workshop's window. So they have a lot of, they carry a lot of those notions Games Workshop kind of gives them. And I think what I'm discovering about Relic Blade, one thing that makes Relic Blade, uh, you know, the best miniature war game in the world is that it it isn't constrained in the same way as these other miniature war games because think like you said Mordheim and like you even mentioned Mordheim being maybe what you were thinking about when you're gonna make relic Blade, you know and that's just a sort of example of how we're like these where these ideas are being f like filled from the external you know we're filtering and creating these new things and, and through all of these filters including mine being playing with gi joes on my desk as a child it, that it's sort of 
it's all being condensed into this new game. Not, not a new game, so to speak, but a kind of new understanding of the potential of the Relic Blade system and how what makes it unique from any other miniature war games is that flexibility. Because, like, people who want to play D&D, but maybe also want to play, like, a miniature war game and have a really uh, fun, like, crunchy miniature war game style skirmish battle. Like, you know, who's to say in the future that there isn't a Relic Blade RPG that yeah. allows you to take a GM and take those traditional elements of your party group and then, you know, role play adventures, but then maybe now it's time to battle and then you're playing Relic Blade or something like that. You know, there's, yeah. there's, that's kind of what I discovered while designing the solo is that really what you can do with a Relic Blade like core system is so it's so interesting because there's so many cool ways that we can go and like as this experience figuring out this kind of template format to be able to deliver like narrative content um is really exciting because like all of this the little scenarios and skirmishes that come in the pamphlets and stuff are essentially that you know like if i think about the the watchtower one you know like yeah. the lone guard yeah. or like there's there's a story in it. it's like a micro story and so but it, it says it, it requires the player to like build okay you know what why are, what's the danger that we're trying to light why are we trying to light who are we trying to signal all of these cool little questions but that that opening um also you know for some people that opening is a sandbox for them to fill with all their fun ideas and for some people it's 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 intangible it's inaccessible because it's too open you know and so like this ability to for us to be able to kind of go into that almost video game designer role where we're like okay what we want you to see is this room over here that has this thing in it because this is what the story is about it isn't about the temple defense you know over there it, this is a very like we're going through a story and these yeah. are the things we want you to experience and these are the things we want you to see you know a, a example like exploring theme you know like mm -hmm. um a bone in darkness adventure should feel different than um a justice so uh you know solo mission you should yeah. as the player you should in interact with different things and make different decisions that allow you to sort of experience that in a sort of traditional narrative way like that we get from other mediums yeah. you know and it's like what other game yeah, can deliver that, that like, that well like how how specific is too specific in a world where you want people to be able to bring their own war bands or their mm -hmm. own characters to the adventure and how vague is too vague where it's like all right well it could be anything um because i know that i want relic blade to be both I want it to I want you to be able to bring your own characters on an adventure. But I also want to be able to bring more narrative and and bring more of a storytelling element to it. And I feel like you need characters that can like do stuff. You know, like um uh like in Volglands being able to have Vandis Greycloak be a named character that does stuff um was really good, but I think I can go a little bit farther where I can have yeah, uh, I don't know. There's there's a lot of stuff that I want to do, which is another thing that's frustrating about having had to like really refine this play that we're moving forward with to like finally make that shot and to define the Relic Blade Adventure mode, you know, mm -hmm. tactical RPG mode. Um, and and that's the thing is like I've got all these other things that I want to be able to continue adding to it. And then also the pressure of, of wanting to also be able to make sure the sludge community is getting, you know, new scenarios or new content. Yeah, and make, yeah, sure that's, that, uh, that's... make sure that Blaster is getting creative new stuff from me also. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's a, a lot, lot of to reasons juggle. to support Sean Sutter. That's for sure. Because there's, there's a lot that you're doing. You know? And going back to the old dribbling analogy, you got to dribble, you got to move you got to plant and then you got to take the shot and then the shot still has to go into the basket for then the scoring yeah. to happen. And all of those 
sequence of events, you know, rely on the previous sequence to work correctly, you know? And so like, that's, that's this, this process of setting up to try and take the correct shot. Uh, it's going to be cool because like, mm. you know, we, you can miss shots and still learn, you know, but sometimes it makes sense. Just want to make sure. You just want to you do everything you can to, to set yourself up to. Yeah, and I've always make been the best trying shot. to. I'm always trying to make sure each new release of Relic Blade is like a great addition to the game. You know. Yeah. Um, and this is a really ambitious thing that we're we're putting out now. I think so too. Um, but and and on top you know on top of that i want to be able to continue to deliver like really high end stuff and then also dealing with the challenges that producing high end stuff in 2022 is more expensive and more difficult than it was previously yeah and so like that's sort of tough yeah i feel there. it yeah i i think that when we was like yeah we've got oh, there's there's so much you know there's the pipeline is veritably stuff and the excitement for all of these things that we're going to be able to do with is building mm -hmm. uh, one thing that i wanted to talk about we mentioned yesterday but you said something about the first 40 minutes oh what, yeah what was that that was the all right. Yeah, so uh, that's right. I was talking about um, essentially the first first two hours or the first hour of gameplay. Uh, like um, the first time you get, like for in our example, the first time you get Storms of Coral box set or something. Like. Yeah, yeah. And because I've been listening to and watching oh, yeah. a ton of uh, videos on YouTube by Josh Strife Hayes and he mm -hmm. you know I just have it on in the background while I'm shipping orders or whatever but he has this series where he plays um classic video games yeah especially like he has another ones series. that people fondly remember like yeah was that game another actually series. good was that Marcy yeah here she wanted to say hi oh, oh hi. dang look at that it's Marceline I don't know. She doesn't usually come in my studio, but that's, here she is. She just wants uh, to be a kitty. A kitty. Yeah, so he has another series called, like, uh, The Worst MMO or something, mm -hmm. where he, he plays, like, the worst MMOs he can find. Um, and then gives them, like, a honest, you know, eight-hour play and, and records his experience. And the, it's sort of a stupid exercise because like there are a lot of trash MMOs that are essentially like yeah you know, he's cash shops yeah he, and he discovers that very yeah. often you find that in those videos if you watch them um, but it's also interesting for um, game design because if you can see what's done wrong and it's done really wrong you can start to recognize how things can be a little wrong in something that overall was good does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. Like, uh, like if you can identify these major mistakes, then it also makes it easier to think about how small degrees of those mistakes can be made. But one of the things he talks about a lot is, like, uh, that first two hours. And I guess, um, like, on Steam, you can return a game if you've played it for less than two hours. Is that right? Yeah, the Steam something like policy. that, and so so people really are critical right in the beginning, and um and so I know video game theory doesn't necessarily directly translate to tabletop theory, but there's a lot of similar stuff and different problems that are even more intense in tabletop because getting to your first game of a tabletop miniatures game, you could easily be more than 100 hours in. And easily both players are more than $100 in. <laughs> you know, even with, um, with a rel like, say, Infinity, that's smaller mo model count, um, you know, you could end up where both players are 
at least a hundred dollars into their figure collection, but then also easily a hundred dollars into a, even a, a basic terrain setup for Infinity. Unless you're just playing with like cardboard boxes, which they they do. They work hard to address those problems. Um, but like the tokens, the playthrough, just like all kinds of stuff, ends up being complicated to get a game on the table and like warhammer is a really good example Mm because warhammer fantasy i bought i bought the box set when i was i think i was i turned 14 when i bought like it was that birthday that i got that first uh warhammer fantasy battle box set and um i think i didn't play my first Warhammer Fantasy Battle game until I was 18. Mm. You know, four years of painting orcs and painting empire guys and being reading the interested rule book in and this being idea. very interested in playing before, like, really getting a, a full game on the table. Like, you know, I played with cardboard cutouts against friends who were really interested in the game mechanics. I played with a few painted models for friends who are just more interested in the few painted models. But an actual game of Warhammer Fantasy took me like almost five years to get on the table. Yep. And I um, collected Warhammer Fantasy right before they, in ninth, before they, before the old world was doomed. And no, I didn't play a single game. No, that like, was as a matter of fact, I actually. That game increasingly unplayable. Yeah. So now that we're thinking about this, I actually. Bought a ogre battle force, had them all the square bases, the regiments and stuff. Worked for many hours to never get them to the table, only to have them sit in a storage sort of thing for two years while Age of Sigmar came out. The Age of Sigmar dropped. Everyone went ape shit for it, and by that I mean angry. And well, then, yeah, I mean that initial Age of Sigmar. Was yeah, that yeah, it was, it was, it was crazy. And so I didn't get into that. It was then Age of Sigmar First Edition with the Stormcast Lady on the cover. Now I'm playing with my ogres, bruh. <laughs> you know, and I rebased them to circular bases, and and it's great. It was awesome. Yeah. But yeah, that was straight up like, like hold. Whole children have lived lives as toddlers and developed, yeah. you know, like it, it's crazy. Like yeah, a whole it's a new world, a whole movie. Yeah, like yeah it literally is. Yeah, it's like I, I my skin my, cells have almost completely regenerated in the yeah, time. Like I bought my my Warhammer army during the George Bush administration. Yes, finally, yes. Yeah, Barack Obama. Was, oh uh, my gosh, that's a crazy. <laughs> that's actually a hilarious and awful way to think about the way yeah. we interact with everything. Yeah. So but you this, bought, yeah, you got your ogres full on during like early Obama, and then didn't play until after Trump. Yeah, oh my, it was like a whole, and yeah, that the whole the even several just, administrations later. Yeah, and even just being interested in something for that long is crazy. And it, it, what other, is there another hobby that like allows people to? Oh inter- yeah. Yeah, all, that, all kinds of, every hobby that there allows people, people to interact. Like, oh, I really want to climb a mountain, or climb this mountain, and they just love like reading about mountain. mountains, yeah. but they'll just not climb that mountain. Yeah, yeah, I feel it. So the yeah. forty minutes thing, in contrast to the seven and a half years. Yeah, what's what is? Yeah, those so thoughts? I'm I'm exploring this idea. I think I think uh, part of it is. Um, part of it is the, if you start the timer, when people start like caring about Relic Blade, then we're talking about the website, talking about marketing, we're talking about illustrations and painted models and, and YouTube videos, right? Mm-hmm. Um, which all could be way better than it is now. <laughs> you know, I haven't had a we chance know. to update my website since like 2018, maybe. Um, you know, I've got like a new image and new products, but like I haven't really done like a re overhaul. The back end stuff, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, like how how to play. This graphics probably still have black and white cards on them. Uh, but anyways, like 
but what 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 is it? What is the for when do you start the timer for a miniature game? And I think it's probably while you're reading the rule book. I would say that because that for reading me the is rule book, you need the rules to like make sense. You can't be like, oh, this is gobbledygook. Uh, this is bananas. I don't know. I still don't know how to like resolve an attack. Whereas I can be reading, you know, one of Joe McCullough's rule books, and as it goes through the phases. I'm like seeing examples of combat. I'm getting like a certain level of like, ah, yeah, the gears are turning. You know, you'll read through some unit profiles and you're like, oh, okay, cool. A skeleton would do this. You know, mm-hmm. oh, you know, oh, this scenario I see it has skeletons in it. Like, you know, you can. And so, really, part of the gameplay is theory crafting and where you're like, or, or theory hammer or whatever you want to call it, where you're like, list building or like imagining a, how it would play out in your head um so that i think that's part of it and then another part is like tutorials like how do you integrate tutorial into gameplay and into a fun experience and i think maybe i'll maybe i'll mess with doing more like narrative how to play videos um because i think that the animation of seeing someone pick up and move a figure could be more engaging than telling someone, all right, now pick up and move your figure. That's how you move. <laughs> yeah. I'm with but it. it's important stuff because you need to know how to move, like when you're rolling dice, what the stuff means. And then there's also like behind the scenes stuff that I could talk about or, or start to communicate. Like, dice represent how much effort that character is gonna do during the round you know it's not action points it's all effort and expertise all represented by a number of dice so a a wizard is an expert really high level expert in all kinds of things and has six dice Mm -hmm. bill man is not an expert He's a he's a good guy. You'd really want like in a if you were walking the streets of Relic Blade, he'd be you'd look at him and you'd be like, that guy knows what he's doing. He's like a journeyman, right? Yeah. Um he has two dice. Yeah, so two is that like I'm I'm an average dude in town. I I maybe make shoes yeah. or something. I'm a cobbler. That's yeah, is that well, two dice in cobbler, Relic Blade? A cobbler would probably have two dice, but no actions, other than the basic well, the, actions. He'd well, be yeah, able to yeah, dodge, yeah, for sure. Improvise attack. Uh huh. Because that's that's as we're talking about behind the scenes, not to hijack the conversation, but mm-hmm. the character cards in Relic Blade, like yeah, like a knight with with a, a vicious strike, long sword, the health, the ability to carry yeah. two potions, um, three armor, four actions. That yeah. is a high level character. Oh, like yeah. in terms like of a like lore, a RPG, like, a, yeah. like if we're talking about like in a role playing game stuff, where these are high, like most relic play characters that you play are at the on the high level yeah. realm, you know? Yeah, and, like a, yeah, that it represents someone who's dedicated their life to being a warrior. Yeah, and it's uh, represented by both their AD and also their skill set, and that's yeah. why a cobbler. Like in in the context of a relic blade, make shoe yeah. is not an action, yeah. or it takes well, too yeah, long. Although, <laughs> if I made a card of a cobbler, make shoe would be one of his skill, like his proficiencies for his class. Yeah, you know, fix shoes, but like, yeah, in a combat situation, you can only improvise. Yeah. <laughs> At least he got a hammer. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but his hammer is only as strong as an improvised implement because mm-hmm. he's not an expert with it. Whereas, you know, the uh, Lone Guard Watchmen, they're professional soldiery, right? Yeah. They, are, they are weathered fighters from the frontiers, and they still only have two dice. But part of their profession gives them an actual like hand weapon and how to use it, a shield that gives them armor too. Uh, they also carry bows, which represents how on the frontier they need to be self-sufficient with with a, a wide variety of options. Um, 
you know, the the uh, spear gobs. They're professional soldiers. They've got a shield. They've got a spear. They also are used to fighting in groups. They've got that super loyal ability. Anyway, so there's there's a lot of, that goes into exactly like how all of that plays out like how character classes are represented how skill is represented and then gameplay wise how how dice can be spent as a fluid resource that represents effort so it's a fluid thing like if i'm running full speed yeah you can spend all of your effort running and you'll go farther and faster than if you didn't yeah if you're trying to parkour really smoothly over stuff you're more likely to fall into pits whereas if you stop and pay attention to jumping from one roof to the other by using f- focus yeah action, by focus your jump then, exactly. then that's a character taking some of their fluid effort and and applying it to not falling into a ravine right mm-hmm. um so anyways like i think there are ways i can show all that in a in a video or in maybe in a comic because that plays more to my skill set right yeah. but i don't need to i don't necessarily want someone to read a 30 page comic and be like okay i get it no, okay i know how to fight focus. yeah you know, we can kind of breeze through it a little bit faster It'd be cool to have it animated you know like a, have it animated and styled as a tactics rpg on a grid because i have the um you know, isometric drawings of mm-hmm. characters that look kind of like a video game. Like, yeah, that'd yeah. be cool, right? But it's a miniatures game, so why not feature the miniatures, right? Yep. The, the, so, yeah, I just run into... Well, again, we were that. talking about before what makes Relic Blade unique, and, and, it, and yes, it is a miniatures game, but it is a miniatures game that is headed up by this artist guy who used to do, in one day, complete comic book pages from drawing to lining to yeah. inking to coloring and then maybe sleeping yeah. so you know you've got a very particular set of skills that and for me when i think about it when we're talking about the timer and like when does it start for me it definitely is the rule book yeah you know like if i don't if because for me there's it's like a sequence of uh, getting into a game and for me as i get older getting into a game is um not about buying models there's a models become a sort of fixed target there'll be a vector of interest like for example like uh stargrave is a great example because i i don't really have a great interest in playing stargrave but those plastic kits are so dang cool that I wanted to get the kits, you know? And, but since, like I said, I have a, like a way that I get into games, I get the rule book first, you know? And with Joe's style of writing, I kind of knew what I was getting into with, with Stargrave. Yeah. Um, and so it wasn't the, the same, but I'm still getting that rule book and I'm reading through it, I'm familiarizing myself with certain concepts. It's essentially like I'm trying to see what the writer is trying to show me. And once I see that, that's when I feel like now I can take it and go yeah. where I want to go. Yeah, and I think Relic Blade, I think there, there, you know, there are things I did right as I'm reflecting back on, like, what, what was it? Was it good or bad? There's a lot of things you did uh, right. You know, like pulling pulling up the book. Um, beautiful. The the big the big two spread right there. Yeah, core rules. But then uh, having you know pictures of the tokens, pictures of the cards, uh, talking about terrain, and then like having some this picture of a knight shield bashing a pig. Oh, off you know, the like, off oh, the thing, yeah, the it. rampart, yeah. Terrain, play area, balance, playing, and cards. Okay, cards have they look like cards. Initiative, you've got like, oh, the knight stabbed him first. You know, like mm-hmm. reinforcing ideas. That's funny uh, because I didn't, up. I never connected that that image with okay. the word initiative. Like I didn't, oh, yeah. I didn't connect initiative with 
he's striking first i just always like every time i look at that illustration the illustration like plays in my head i just hear mm. you like yeah, it's it. like a, a a clang slice you know it's just a short little animation of a pig getting slashed this this artwork oh the original i agree because it's telling you you're setting it's telling you everything you can imagine it and it's different than a photo because a photo you think well that's what it is like oh yeah, these yeah, are yeah. Warhammer models on a table mm -hmm. i don't have a table i don't have you know i have some sprues i don't have paints in my box set but here like it's like this is imagining what it would be like you know um and then also speaking of like actions we've got a uh, action pool with a pile of dice and it explains the dice uh explains how to read a thing the action bar um and then this little thing where it's like movement oh yeah i love that one moving he's like uh, climbing like he's thinking about climbing he's gonna climb he falling down like he tried to jump and he fell on his head like um that does have like a show it yeah and i've that that was you are 1000 percent correct about uh thinking that you did something right with those because it was that exact relationship between relic blade the game relic blade the miniatures and relic blade the art which made me fall in love with the rule book as i read it for the first time because i saw like just the simple detail that you drew the base on the guy you're not mm -hmm. drawing a guy you're drawing a figure you know but that figure is also like in its own malleable 3d world that yeah, it gets like to the move and do things you know like the charge the charge steps that the figure is physically moving it almost takes on like a toy story like these are alive mm -hmm. type of thing and like to you say your point the imagination part of it is really interesting and yeah. i just simply loved that illustrative um like show show part about it but mostly because in modern days interacting with the rule book and um we one thing that when we were hanging out last year and you got uh, the silver bayonet and we were looking through it and we were both, mm -hmm. I think we both noticed that it didn't have any photos of miniatures. Yeah. And we were like, yeah. whoa, this is like, that's different. That's a different thing. You know, there's, that's, mm -hmm. that's a, a different approach and it feels different as a reader and stuff. And with mo mainly dealing with games, workshop codexes and stuff, being, being into games workshop for so long that I, have been able to at one point know an artist's name by seeing an image to now not even knowing if it was drawn by a person i'm not able to interact with the art anymore and so yeah. that was one thing that like was a it was like a i guess for lack of a better term it was a nail in the coffin for me to kind of shed these more corporate style of games and go into the indie realm because i could tell that you wrote this book and drew those images you know yeah. i could there was an innate connection between yeah. all of and there's stuff even happening. a level of like goofiness to my writing style dude just look at the, yeah the exactly the, the line work the the, the fan what the what was the, the filthy pig out master Oh yeah, you know, like that, and he's just like standing there, just like it was like a, it is hilarious, you know, and all those little charms and quirk is what make it interesting, and yeah. that I, I'm sure that a ton of people share my experience that this sort of that connectivity between all aspects of it is, um, really just unique, and and mm -hmm. you know that's what that's what makes Relic Blade intrinsically connected to to you you know which is i think sometimes when we talk i kind of get the the impression sometimes for that from how you're speaking that you are a little bit blind to the sean sutter part and you're looking at the relic blade part and you see that and you think that people only see the relic blade part too or are only thinking about the relic blade part sometimes mm -hmm. and it's like no they like see right through it straight to Sean, you know, and there's this there's this connection between I think people that really enjoy Relic Blade and also 
really enjoying you as a person and your particular touches that you bring. You know, it feels like Sean's game. You know, and when play and when uh, Tasha's Commandos hits, and they all have those similar elements. You know, but Tasha's Commandos is going to be a whole new fun experience of you know you getting to illustrate because I I don't think you've actually drawn any Tasha's Commandos. Yeah, not really. Yeah. You know, so there's like a whole fun world of new illustrations and things. And, and that's mm-hmm. just, that's a, that's a Metal King studio only kind of vibe, you know? Yeah. The only other person that gives me a similar vibe is a uh, old Hankerin Farinal, like the Runehammer, you know? Because when I read his books and I know that he did all the illustration and oh, his, yeah. ri- and his writing you style. Got that, like... You get that writing style, yeah. the personality, the art, the lines are the same as the mm-hmm. attitude. And it, and it feels yeah. like I'm having a conversation with someone as opposed yeah. to like absorbing information. And I think that's a big thing about when you play Relic Blade, like maybe for people, maybe, I'm sure for some people that are like maybe sure. brand new to Relic Blade or they're not very into it or only get to play it every once in a while or something, that when they play it, you know, they're just playing a game. But I'd like to imagine that because of how the community's set up, because of this the unique situation of this game, that when people play Relic Blade, because I know that's that's how it is for me. When I play, there is like a a spirit Sean, you know, hovering over the game area, you know, and just sort of like there, uh, artistically spurning our interactions with each other, you know, where there is this sense of of Seanness, just like emanating throughout the game session, and I think it I think it comes from just knowing all of these like connected things. Because I'll look at a picture on a card, and I knew that you drew it. Yeah, you know, so it's like yeah, it's so, inescapable. So then, how do I how do I onboard a new person who isn't inspired by the idea that it's me? And I think part of it could be more of like a video that is showing like that connectivity of, of like art and cards and showing cards and play and, and characters going through the steps of how to play. And then, uh, yeah, cause there's different ways to learn. And I think the rule book delivers it pretty well, but it could stand to have like a full like battle report. And that would be something I could do with a, a, a well-made video, be able to show like, this is movement. This is, you know, the thief is like running away from these pigs. She's got to figure out whether she's going to focus to jump over this thing. Here's how jump works. Here's how climb works. She's doing this like parkour escape thing. And then, you know, in the next scenario, uh, showing actions of combat and then doing like a full playthrough of like, you know, whoever's pursuing her plus her justice allies, you know, like something like that. Like could a slow. Be very cool. So I know that like in in these past couple of years, Games Workshop for their flagship games, Age of Sigmar, and they have been releasing like a three tiered starter set. There's like a forty dollar oh, yeah. one, there's like an eighty dollar one, and like a hundred twenty dollar one. And I know inside those, because I bought like the the eighth eighth edition iterations, and they kind of had it, the flip. They came with like a foldable mats, you know, yeah. printed mats. And then on those mats, on one side it was like the full printed cool art. But on the yeah. other side, it had like circles that said like A, B, and C. And then you would literally read through the thing and be like, place the Marine with the bolt pistol on A and place the Nurgle guy on C. Yeah. And and so there's these positions that you place them in and then you play through the scenario. Yeah. Would you kind of thinking something similar to that, like like yeah. a like a physical thing Sorry, that somebody but not really would have and read through? Because I think I think that when I've played through that sort of like, all right, now play a scenario where now you know how to shoot. So, so you shoot. <laughs> I'd have a scenario with three guys and they're going to shoot at each other. Like that doesn't really feel necessary to me. But I think a run through with that's more like a more like a cartoon or like a story. Yeah, narrative. Uh, just like, all right, you know, 
the character this is how a character moves and you, you don't have to like pick up a figure to move it to know that a character moves you know to, but yeah, then to, to know being able moves. to like, get into then a battle report where there's a little bit more in the first few turns breaking down like there are a lot of options this character has is she going to a focus on the objective b dising you know focus on the disengage move and then try and dodge is she going to dodge first and then move because she might get hit like you know there's there's a certain depth of relic bladiness that maybe doesn't hit a player until they're halfway through their first game or second game I'm or with maybe, that. yeah so i think there's a way to like start delivering because those are all in in the theory and i think it, it exists in the rule book but having maybe a the quick start guide be a, a longer document that like has more of those illustrated half illustration sort of uh playthrough maybe that's the option yeah is to like do a, a more in-depth because yeah if, if if you take that idea of like um you know a small story mm-hmm. you could have the night you know, your knight and your two pigs, and the knight's doing a thing, and then the two pigs show up, and he's got, oh gosh, yeah. gotta do this thing. Yeah. You know, and, and then, then like... and then you can do turn three is where the character, the reinforcements arrive. Yeah. For both sides, and then they set up and play from there, because now they understand all the options, and the option branch explodes into this like full on scenario. But that those first couple turns where you're learning like how to move and how to dodge and like protect your friends and how recovery rolls work, like uh, that stuff, I think, yeah, it is just the tutorial. But then that first that first half hour of gameplay would be from where the tutor- where the rails come off and you've got a couple more characters arrive on the battlefield. And each side is is then engaging more with the options. And I think Storms of Coral is is really good, but none of the characters are very simple. Like I really was trying to respect a, people's um, ability to like grasp more complicated characters. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's possible. Yeah. Uh, anyways, that's stuff I've been thinking about. Like, how do I really nail that first? hour of gameplay like how do i really uh capture someone's imagination that they'll really get stuff on the table and i think maybe having this discussion now i'm i am leaning toward a quick start guide that you know includes some like paper standees or whatever but would start with more on the rails like explaining move explaining actions explaining dodging and protecting your friends and recovery rolls but then getting into kind of a complicated, not overly complicated, but a more uh, challenging game state. And then that's when the hands, when the hand holding ends is like, you understand now your character needs to either go and protect the knight or go and claim the objective or go and attack the enemy. You understand that the stakes are high and you've got a lot of options. Now you're in charge of what what happens, you know. Um, maybe that's where I'd go with it. I dig it. It's an interesting question. I mean, the, you know, also because new players are really important for the uh, health of my business. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, what is their impression, and what are the barriers that really hit? Because, like we talked about. Um, miniature games it could it can be many years before between buying it and playing it if you ever get to that yeah and i think we are both in agreement that that's not that's not that cool you know we want we want to play we want to play with our stuff and that's one thing i think also um is kind of another kind of reason why us taking our time to make sure this format works is because we want to be able to deliver more of that content that is about you know people interacting with their stuff as opposed mm-hmm. to just being like all right y'all have all the toys like have fun 
you know, let me know how yeah, it goes. Or moreover, <clears throat> just being like releasing more and more, like because it would be way easier to just release more mm -hmm. and hope that that hope more that people it's like worth it. Your time than yeah. to send me ten dollars. Um, but yeah, I'm all, I'm always like really pushing to try and make really good content, even though it can feel like what I'm thinking of now is that and another thing that the Relic Blade community is pretty insulated. You know, big shout outs to you if you're listening to this. Appreciate you. But I think that if I were to just ponder how, how people hear about Relic Blade, um, it does seem, it seems like a safe bet to say that a large amount of people get into Relic Blade because someone they know told them about it. Mm -hmm. And in that vein, we've talked about in the past this kind of convention kit, a demo kit, uh, a, a sort of a, a set of printed materials, small poster, sign, you know, things to say free demo, have things like at Sean Sutter Art, at Relic Blade, talk about the battle group, all these things. But then now I'm thinking a little bit further based on this idea is like, it would I think it'd be really beneficial to do exactly what we were just talking about, but also develop something that gives the power to like uh, you know our people because I have no um uh, no uh, like I believe that I could con i guess for lack of a better term convert somebody into what makes Relic Blade fun and interesting because of my knowledge, because of the terrain that I have, because of all the figures that I have, and because of my, because I am who I am, I know how to present the game to people in a way that works, because I've done it in a way that hasn't worked many times. Mm -hmm. And so this, this concept of like taking that kind of experience taking the experience that we have from when we're doing the convention spiels, you know, getting people mm -hmm. interested in the Relic Blade within like a minute and a half of talking yeah. and turn that into either a set of scenarios so that we, you loyal, awesome Relic Blade fan who just wants to find other awesome Relic Blade people to play with, download that PDF, go to Kinko's or FedEx or whatever, get your print on, get all your models and stuff that you are so graciously putting forth for strangers to use, go to the store, set up, you know, talk to the store owner and be cool and be like, I would love to set up a demo of Relic Blade in your store. And I've got this poster and I've got this thing. I'm just going to use this table over here. And then, you know, you go on a busy night, uh, hanging out with the peeps. You, you see that guy who's just standing there watching a 40 K game. And you say, Hey, my man, you want to like, play a game and you play them you you introduce this person to relic blade with yeah. this specifically designed scenario packet that's fun for the demo -er, you know and it has like steps in almost like not to say an instruction guide yeah. but sort of like again going back to runehammer uh the amazing things I've really enjoyed reading in ICRPG and in some of his publications is that philosophical the, 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 the here's the, these, think about it like this and then present it like that you know, all of these little like ways of thinking about how to present information and how to use it and explain that to people so that they can really grasp those ideas in a similar way just, you know, talk to them and say you know, the at this point, you know, you might want to mention if it's a brand new player, you might want to mention this. If it's someone who's, you know, played Relic Blade before, but it's been a while, maybe you want to introduce this or something. Or for example, I guess a more solid example would be this side of the scenario, instructional scenarios, is more complex to play. So you should have the new player play with these models because of X, Y, and Z. So they don't have to worry about I don't know, read the wind or something and out of activation turns or something. But sure. if you're playing the complicated one, there's a point at which 
you introduce that mechanic to them. Be like, yeah. Oh, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so, yeah, and then, you know, uh, 90 minutes goes by, and the person's like, that was fun. Where do I buy this? And then they go, oh, realplay.com. Or oh, he points at the sign. <laughs> oh, yeah. cool. It has a QR code on it. You know, oh, yeah. shit. You know, and then you go straight to the thing. So I think it would be really cool because we've talked about doing videos and stuff, doing videos, uh, how to paint stuff, how to play stuff. And I absolutely would love to do that, you know, to get more battle reports out there, to get how to paint a pig, you know, the the fog tribe, you know, yeah. like if you guys have things that you'd want us to see, you'd want to see also. On, you know on the podcast or in a form of content let us know because i'd be interested to see what the relic Bay community is hungry for, what they're yeah. interested in and it's tough because like i i needed to update my website and make new relic blade videos and new gameplay stuff for ages and ages yeah. and ages but it's like it takes forever and anyways but i think that Part of this conversation of like that first 40 minutes of gameplay needs to be like the best part, you know? Yeah. Like, don't save. Don't save cool stuff for later. Stuff yeah, yeah, for, later. for sure. Yeah, like get, get ready. Like, um, I think that that's something I'd really like to deliver next, you know, after this wave of releases is like try to figure out that that quick start guide slash demo experience that like runs you through make that content available make a video of it being done available make potentially even make special characters that are 3d print only so that you can download a demo of relic blade and have the characters that are doing that initial playthrough be like a special edition yeah demo guys Mm -hmm. you know what i mean and i mean going back to that idea i just mentioned i mean if we have incentives yeah actual incentives other than just being a badass uh battle friend which is what most most peeps are most peeps that are sharing and you know it's interesting now that i'm thinking about this like out loud it's like every time like i i don't do a lot of promotion for my music but every time someone like shares it or something like that, I always, I always try to remind them and always try to remind myself that, you know, like, thank you for doing that because that's, the, that's the only way it, that's the only way it exists yeah. is, is because people want to share stuff that, that about the, the stuff that they like, you know? Yeah. So yeah, if there's actual incentives, like <laughs> a cool a freaking individual model for, amazing people who'd like to step up and like yeah. spread the word, you know, be a true, uh, a true advocate, you know, Hey, maybe a true seeker, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of cool possibilities for, yeah. Gonna have. Yeah. So I think that's, I mean, not to like be projecting too far in the future, but I really think it's important to think about that. Like, new player experience and what what is possible and then how to get it on someone's table because yeah because it, it can be tough to visualize you can read a rule book but it's tough to visualize what a game looks like or or all that stuff and so you know and trying to learn from video games because they uh, are really accessible compared to miniature games yeah, and there's like, a lot of stuff to learn to about. Buy an expensive computer or PlayStation or whatever. Um, so, anyways, thinking all about that stuff. There's a lot going on in my head. Uh, yeah, no. but that. I mean, what's our time on this episode? Yeah, no, I think I think we're 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 good there. I think we should just call it. And like I said, yeah. well, if you faithful listener and cool person, um have ideas for future relic bud episodes that you'd like mm -hmm. topics and also potential uh content for the metal king youtube page because like yeah this this concept of we've been working hard uh, behind the scenes the relic buds podcast sort of serves as 
our first foray into you know trying to be more visible and trying yeah. to kind of like be more connected in yeah because like that that's the truth that that we're really connected to it you know if someone's on the discord and asks a question like the relic blade discord's the only discord i don't have muted so if i hear it i'm like what you know and it's just like there's so being close to the community and wanting to give you guys the stuff that you're interested in to make you know the things that you're doing your hobby time more enjoyable your day more enjoyable when you're not doing hobby time all that stuff i'm i'm i would absolutely love for all of our battle friends to be thinking about relic blade all day because yeah. they have they have the luxury yeah, of having uh, all these I think cool really, things to think about. something that would be really helpful or really exciting to hear in the comments would be related to like what your first 40 minutes like yeah. what your first two are like what what got you far enough? And then also for folks who have owned Relic Blade for since 2015 and still haven't played a first game, like what what sort of stuff can help? Like, would it help to see it played? Would it is the biggest barrier just that you need a friend to play with? You know, uh, yeah. You know, introducing it to a friend would it be would it help to have that like? exciting document that like runs you through introducing someone to relic blade anyways yeah I, i'm interested be... to know just like case study style like how did you hear about it like what's up because yeah. mm -hmm. uh, that stuff's really interesting to me just um, let our brains interact with it and roll and yeah because i when i set up the the group the the facebook group to have the the new member like requesting i put just a simple question because thankfully like our group is like amazing like amazing we i literally do not have to mod our group pretty much ever so big shout out to the relic Blade community because probably yeah, legit gonna... the best community on the internet but um i put three quite like how did you hear about relic Blade? just a simple little stop gap to make sure that the person's kind of paying yeah. attention but at the same time i was curious to see how you heard about relic blade and i think i put like only three things like youtube videos a friend told me and then i put the third one for fun that malev talked my ear about it uh, my oh, yeah. talked my ear off about it and so in that same way you know each time i go to accept i'm looking at that and if it if it says youtube video you know like even though that simple questionnaire is very simple the, yeah. the information is useful because I'm like, oh, yeah. YouTube? Okay, YouTube, yeah. personal friend. And it's interesting because nice. it could be a Metal King video, probably not, but it could be. It could be Gorilla Miniature Games. It could be, you know, Black Magic Craft. It could be uh -huh. Gorilla Hobby. Yeah. Like, it could be uh, all kinds of stuff. And yeah. so. Blaster is also the, the, the one that's coming up a little bit oh, too. Oh, yeah, cool. So I think, uh, anyways, it's exciting stuff. And. Uh, I hope this update about like where Metal King Studio is with this new release and like looking at like a late August for a ton of new Relic Blade figurines should ton get new people excited. Yeah, yeah, y'all. Well, thank you, Sean. It's been a pleasure. This is gonna be a. This is gonna be a little. little you guys got like a, a little twofer. A little, yeah. Well, uh, they can. Uh, it's a double. It's like a double Relic Blade episode. Listen Relic to Blade. it on the way to work and mm -hmm. a little bit on the way home. Yeah, get everybody. the get the part two and stuff. Yeah. But all right, y'all. I'll catch you guys next time. Much love and peace.